Leon Dotson, and I am the president of the Washington Map Society. I want to welcome you all to this evening's lecture. It is hosted by a partnership of seven map societies representing all parts of the United States. With that includes the Boston, uh, California, Chicago, New York, Rocky Mountain, and Washington Map Societies, as well as the Library of Congress's Philip Lee Phillips Society. So these societies are all nonprofit organizations that support map collecting, cartography, and the study of cartographic history. These societies are, um, these groups also financially support this Zoom meeting. So if you are not a member, I strongly encourage you joining um, at least one of these map societies or multiple. And please see the chat for links to each of the map societies' websites. We'll be entering them in the chat. Um, so just so you know that the benefits for, vary for each society, um, just to talk about the Washington Map Society, for example, our members receive three annual issues of the Portalon Journal, um, which is covering exclusively cartographic content from um, all time periods and all geographies around the world. You also get digital access to every single past issue of the Portalon, which includes over 100 issues. Um, as well as digital access to past guest lectures for, we have over 30 guest lectures that are available to view on our, on our website, um, as well as other features. So if you're not a member, I encourage you to become one. Um, and we have an introductory rate of just $25 for the first year for new members. Um, a few requests now for this evening's meeting. If everyone could please go ahead and mute yourself, um, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, once we are in the lecture, if you have comments or questions, please type them in the chat function and we and Chris will address them at the end of the presentation. Um, so please, instead of using your microphones and speaking up, go ahead and use the chat function for any questions or, or um, comments you would like to make. Um, after the Q&A, we will have some time for um, members to socialize if they like, so you are welcome at that point to turn your microphone on and uh, we can chat. I'm now going to turn things over to Ron Grimm, who will um, talk about our future meetings and our current meetings. Hey, welcome everybody. Uh, just a note about the map that is appearing on that screen. Uh, that map was published in the very first issue of the Philip Lee Phillips Society newsletter, um, which was came out in 1996. And you will see there that it represents the map societies that were in existence in 1995. It accompanied an article where we briefly described the history of each map society. So just think how far we've come in 25 years and now we're joined together with uh, Zoom meetings. Okay, uh, with the assistance of the other MAP societies, uh, we have now developed a program schedule through March. Uh, those, those programs for January, February, and March will start appearing on the Washington MAP Society uh, webpage, as well as the other MAP Society's webpages. And the next issue of the portal one will also list those, um, those meetings. Now, our next meeting uh, will be November 19 uh, at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Um, it will feature Kathy Parker, who is the research officer for Barry Ruderman's Antique Maps and the new chair of the Washington Map Society, uh, Walter Risto Prize. Um, she will be speaking to us about the Northern Seas, the mapping of the North Pacific before the voyages of James Cook. Uh, please be aware when you join next month's meeting that Katie will be talking to us from London and she will be getting up at midnight so that she can address us at our regular times. Now, next slide. Okay, for tonight's program, I, at this point, I was going to turn the, uh, the announcements over to uh, Naomi Heiser, who is the program chair for the Rocky Mountain Map Society, uh, because she has been instrumental in helping to plan tonight's program. But I understand it's Naomi's birthday and she's not gonna join us tonight because she's celebrating. <laughs> 
but I want to thank Naomi and I think we can all wish her a happy birthday. Now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, who is Chris Lane, the owner of the Philadelphia Print Shop West in Denver, Colorado. He has worked in the antique print and map business for almost 40 years and has come to be recognized as one of the country's experts in this field as evidenced by his 22 year stint as print and map expert on PBS's Antique Roadshow. Since moving to Denver, he has made the history of Western maps and views a particular focus, producing a number of articles on this topic and lecturing at the Denver Public Library and other local venues. I now turn the program over to Chris, who will focus on the mapping of the West in a talk entitled Prejudice and the Shaping of the American West. I hope that you enjoy tonight's presentation. And again, if you have questions, please chat, type them in the chat feature and Chris will address them at the end of the talk. Chris? Okay. That look good to everybody, hopefully. Can everybody see the uh, screen? Fine. It's fine. Yeah. Looks great. Yes, looks great. All right, let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. Uh, all right. Well, thanks uh, to all the map societies, which they just discussed, um, uh, involved in this excellent series of Zoom lectures uh, for allowing me to make this presentation. Uh, since I moved to Denver in 2010, the political development of the American West has become a topic of great interest to me. So it is great fun to put together this talk. The intent of this talk is to provide a general overview of the changing political shape of the Trans-Mississippi West from the end of the 18th century to the early part of the 20th century, using period maps to help illustrate this complex subject. The period maps provide a couple of unique perspectives on this topic. First, there were lots of very short-lived uh, border changes, and these maps show these transitory political divisions as they happened. But they also show us, interestingly, political configurations that didn't happen. This is because map publishers did not want their maps to be out of date. So they thought a new if a new political border was gonna be drawn, they better add it to their maps. And sometimes they did that and the border was never drawn. So we get to see what somebody planned but never happened. Now there are a number of forces which determine how the Western political landscape was shaped. Two of the most important ones are obvious, economics and political considerations. However, there is also the insidious factor of prejudice, which runs through the entire story and which has three main components. First, there was religious prejudice against the Mormons who were looked on with suspicion uh, to a great extent because of their belief in polygamy. Now this prejudice manifested itself in the persistent curtailment of Mormon power and lands by the federal government. Then there was also the widely held Anglo prejudice against Native Americans. This was manifested in the repeated and unconscionable taking away of Indian lands. Finally, of course, You're muted, you're muted, Chris. You're muted, Chris. All right, back. Am I back? Yes. You're back. Yes, okay. you're back. You're back. <laughs> All right. Um, anyway, uh, let's see. We're okay. Finally, of course, there was the prejudice against blacks. This manifested itself in the desperate and constant attempts to protect and expand slavery. As we shall see, these efforts played a seminal role in the shaping of the American West. Oh uh, no, let's see. I'm not, uh, okay, there we go. Initially, the British colonies, which later became the United States, were limited to the lands east of the Appalachian Mountains. With the victory in the French and Indian Wars in 1763, the British got control of all of North America east of the Mississippi, except for New Orleans and Florida. At the turn of the century, the Trans-Mississippi West consisted of three political regions, all controlled by foreign powers, 
There was Louisiana, which was French territory. There was New Spain or Mexico, which was Spanish territory. And finally, there was a northwestern part of the continent, which was claimed by the British and the Spanish with a small Russian presence. Over the century, the next century, this area went from three political entities to 23. This talk will look at the changes which led to this result. Now, there are three main types of changes we're going to see. First, we have the acquisition of what were foreign lands by the United States. Then came the introduction of territorial governments for previously, quote, unorganized territories. Those are territories which had no formal government. And finally, we'll see the breaking up of these large territories into smaller territories and then states. The first period we're gonna look at is 1803 to 1844. That is the Louisiana Purchase and the subsequent political development of those lands. On April 30th, 1803, the United States purchased the French Louisiana territory consisting of the lands extending west of the Mississippi River to the crest of the Rocky Mountains. This purchase essentially doubled the size of the United States. Within a year of the Louisiana Purchase, the process of breaking up this vast new US territory into smaller political units was begun, a process which wasn't finished until 1889. In 1804, the territory of Orleans was created out of the relatively settled part of the Purchase, which was the home of a mainly French population. The rest of the Louisiana Purchase became the Louisiana Territory. Less than a decade later, in 1812, the Orleans Territory was made into the state of Louisiana. And what had been the Louisiana Territory was now called the Missouri Territory. The creation of the state of Louisiana was intended mostly to balance the free state of Ohio admitted in 1803 with a new slave state. In 1800, the number of free states in the United States was matched by the number of slave states. As the population of the North began to outstrip that of the South, leading to control of the House of Representatives by Northerners, Southerners began to focus on the need to keep the number of free and slave states balanced so they would not also lose power in the Senate. This remained a driving concern for Southerners for the next six decades, playing a huge role and how the borders of the West were drawn. Beginning in 1818, Americans who had settled west of the Mississippi River around St. Louis petitioned the government to carve a state for them out of the Missouri Territory. Their petition included the establishment of a southern border at the parallel of 36 degrees 30 minutes, which is the same latitude as the borders of Tennessee, Kentucky, and Virginia and North Carolina. This is a very important line which we'll come back to again and again. Now, the Northerners were loath to create a new slave state out of Missouri territory. So this petition was not acted on right away. It did seem, however, that eventually a new state would be created there. And this left a gap between Louisiana and the proposed state of Missouri. So in 1819, Congress created the Arkansas territory in this space using the 3630 parallel as its northern border. The agitation of the settlers around St. Louis to create a state came to fruition in 1820 with the creation of the state of Missouri by means of the Missouri Compromise. Maine had been clamoring to come in as a new state. It had hitherto been part of Massachusetts, but Southern congressmen demanded a new slave state to match. So a compromise was reached allowing Missouri to come in as a slave state at the same time that Maine was admitted as a free state. Now, as planned, Missouri was admitted with its southern border along that, uh, that of the Arkansas Territory at 36 degrees 30 minutes. That is, except for the Missouri Boot Hill, where the border goes down to the 36th parallel from the St. Francis River east of the Mississippi. Now, there are a number of purported reasons for why there was this deviation in the border. One, one account says that there was a local resident who asked to remain in Missouri because, quote, he had heard it was so sickly in Arkansas, full of bears and panthers and copperhead snakes, so it ain't safe for civilized people to stay there overnight even. Another story had it that a love-struck surveyor ran the line further south 
to spare the feelings of a widow who lived 50 miles south of the 3630 line, but was unaware she might not be in the state of Missouri. Actually, the Missouri boot was the result of the efforts, efforts of one John Hardiman Walker, who was the largest landowner in the area, known as the Czar of the Valley, who wanted his lands to be part of Missouri. His influence in, uh, swayed Congress to add the boot to the new state. The Missouri Compromise brought into the United States matching free and slave states, but there was another equally important aspect to this compromise. This was to limit any new slave states except for Missouri to being south of the 3630 line, no slavery being allowed north of that line. Now, a few years later, in 1824 to 28, the western part of the Arkansas Territory was broken off so as to create lands reserved for Native Americans. This caused the Arkansas Territory to be reduced to just the eastern part uh, south of the new state of Missouri. Now, this introduces the notion of Indian territory within the boundaries of the United States. From the earliest days of European settlement, Indians had been removed from their lands and forced to move west. This was but the start of a long series of cases where Euro-Americans decided Indian lands were useful to them, so they forced the Native Americans out of those lands and pushed them further and further west. This culminated in the 1834 Indian Intercourse Act, when the Indians were given, quote, all that part of the United States west of the Mississippi, but not within the states of Missouri, Louisiana, or the territory of Arkansas. Now this large Indian land was officially unorganized and it was set aside solely for the use of Indians. Notably, these lands were at the outer edge of the country. Remember the country only included the Eastern part and then up to the Rocky Mountains. Um, and they were acted actually as a buffer between the states, the developed states and the Spanish territory. So that was nice. And most of this land had been named by Stephen Long as a great desert. And it was described in this 1833 map by Barbara and Willard as quote, this district is a vast wilderness of immense plains and meadows interspersed with barren hills and almost destitute of wood. That is, these lands were considered of no use to anyone and so good enough for the Indians. However, as time passed, Euro-Americans expanded into these, quote, unsettled lands, which were actually quite fecund. And as that happened, the Indian rights were taken away, sometimes by treaty and often by force. Much of the history of the Western United States for the rest of the century was a whittling down of these Indian lands to a much reduced stump. Actually, right from the beginning, not all of this land was given to the Indians, despite what the Indian Intercourse Act said. In the early 1830s, the federal government was claiming lands in Western Illinois where the Sauk Indians were located. In the 1832 Black Hawk War, Black Hawk led the Sauk in a fight to retain their lands in Western Illinois. In 1833, the Sauk lost the war and were forced to give up not only their Illinois lands, but also a strip of land west of the Mississippi, supposedly in the Indian lands. Uh, this was called the Black Hawk Purchase. Euro-Americans poured into and beyond these lands, both for farming and mining lead. And in 1837, there was a, excuse me, I shouldn't have gone forward yet. Let's go back, Oop, there we go. Uh, there was a second Black Hawk purchase of more land to the West. Finally, in 1838, all the land north of Missouri between the Mississippi and the Missouri rivers was created as the Iowa Territory though the Indians did retain some lands there as a reservation. So to summarize, by 1844 in the old Louisiana Purchase, the lands along the Mississippi River had been broken up into small units with two states, Louisiana and Missouri, and two territories, Arkansas and Iowa. The rest of the original Purchase up to the Continental Divide was still unorganized Indian territory. So now we'll turn to the next period, which is only three years, 1845 to 48. During these three momentous years, the final enlargement of the continental United States took place. And this happened in two parts. In the Southwest, it involved the acquisition of Mexican lands. The original border between Mexico and the lands of the Louisiana Purchase was the continental divide 
with the modifications established by the adams onus Treaty of 1819. The borders in the south followed a zigzag line determined by rivers and longitudinal lines, and the northern border limited Spanish authority to lands below the 42nd parallel. The first change to these borders was in the Mexican province of Texas. In 1821, when Mexico achieved independence from Spain, the northern provinces of Texas, New Mexico, and Alta California were sparsely populated. In 1823, Mexico, in hopes of strengthening her position in the north, let Stephen F. Austin set up a colony of Americans in the province of Texas. Tensions between the Mexican government and the American colonists began to escalate in the 1830s, leading to an outbreak of fighting in late 1835 after Santa Ana overthrew the Mexican constitution and set up a dictatorship. By 1836, the Texans had won their independence and set up the Republic of Texas. Now, right from the beginning, many Texans wanted Texas to be annexed into the United States. But even more importantly, Southerners in the United States wanted to annex Texas. They had looked at a map of the United States and saw how much of the land of the new territory in the country that would be open for new states lay north of the 3630 parallel compared to what was available for new slave states below that line. Thus, many in the South wanted to add Texas to the country for all of it would be open to slavery under the Missouri Compromise. In any case, in 1845, Texas was admitted as a new state. This annexation outraged Mexico, which had never accepted Texas independence, and this increased tension along the disputed border. Soon war resulted, but in less than a year and a half, the Mexican Republic had to sue for an unfavorable peace. This resulted in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo on February 2nd, 1848, in which, in which Mexico received $18 million, and in return, the United States received undisputed control of Texas, and in addition, the United States also added other lands from northern Mexico, consisting of the provinces of Alta California and New Mexico. This acquisition is called the Mexican Cession, and it increased the size of the United States by about 20%. The second major addition to the United States in the years between 1845 and 1848 took place in the Pacific Northwest. From the beginning of the century, there were conflicting claims in this region by the Spanish, Russians, British, and Americans. By 1818, only the British and American claims remained to any significant degree. The British were in there with the Hudson's Bay Company network of trading routes and forts. And the Americans claimed the area because of Robert Gray's discovery of the Columbia River in 1792 and the Louisiana Purchase. But mostly the Americans wanted the area to provide them with an outlet to the Pacific. A treaty in 1818 between Great Britain and the United States set the 49th parallel as the border between British Canada and the United States from west of Lake of the Woods to the Rocky Mountains. West of the Rockies, it created joint control of the so-called Oregon country, which was then relatively unsettled. Naturally, this joint control didn't work. The Hudson Bay Company aggressively fought against US fur traders moving into the region. Meanwhile, American settlers began to arrive in the late 1830s along the Oregon Trail, culminating in the Great Migration of 1843. In order to avoid war, both countries needed to reach an agreement. Thus, in the 1846 Oregon Treaty, it extended the British-American border along the 49th parallel all the way to the Pacific, which they probably should have done back in 1818. In any case, between 1845 and 1848, the United States was officially established as a transcontinental nation, adding the final third of its continental territory. For the rest of the century, the story becomes that of breaking up the American West into smaller units. In 1847, Brigham Young led the Mormons out of Illinois to the Salt Lake Valley so they could practice their religion without interference. Interestingly, Young is known to have used copies of the map by S. Augustus Mitchell that is shown here during the immigration. Now, Young had an expansionist view hoping to establish Mormon settlements throughout the huge region lying west of the Rockies and east of the Sierra Nevadas from Oregon in the north to Mexico in the south. The Mormons came to call this region Deseret, 
which according to the Book of Mormons means honeybee. The Mexican session came into the United States in 1848 without any official organization or political setup. In 1849, both California and New Mexico applied for statehood. Now, Young did not want, Brigham Young did not want to be left behind. So he petitioned for the establishment of a state of Deseret. And this is one of those maps that shows something that never happened. It shows the state of Deseret, which of course never happened. Anyway, it encompassed this huge area there. Now, many of the United States government were anti-Mormon and Congress was reluctant to give the Mormons such a seat of power. So Deseret was never recognized. Still, the Mormons set up a government and ran the area for a few years until the Utah Territory was established in 1850. Even then, they didn't give up, unsuccessfully petitioning the federal government to create the state of Deseret in 1856, 1862, and 1872. Now, as it happened, the federal government had their own agenda for the region, which did not favor Mormon control. In 1848, the lands outside of Texas gained in the Mexican War, that is the Mexican Cession, consisted of Upper California and New Mexico, which were officially unorganized territories. The discovery of gold in California in 1849 and increased emigration to the newly acquired lands made it obvious that this territory needed to be divided and politically organized. This resulted in the Compromise of 1850, which had several components. First, the western part of Alta California, which was relatively well-developed and populated, was brought in as a free state of California. At the same time, Texas had its borders modified. Texas had claimed a huge swath of land extending west to the Rio Grande and with the famous chimney uh, running up to the 42nd parallel and passing through today's Colorado, I will uh, point out. Uh, in the Compromise of 1850, Texas accepted a northern border at the 3630 line, specifically so it could remain a slave state. In return for that, Texas got debt relief from the U.S. government. The rest of the Mexican session was divided into two large territories, New Mexico and Utah. Now, the main debate which Congress tried to address with this Compromise of 1850 was, without question, slavery. California was brought in as a free state, but this upset the balance of free and slave states in the country. Also, if you look at this map, both of the new territories of New Mexico and Utah extended north of the 3630 line, meaning they should, in theory, be prohibited from allowing slavery. Now, the Southerners would not accept this result, so the compromise was passed only under the condition that New Mexico and Utah came in under, quote, popular sovereignty where its citizens could vote on whether to be free soil or not. Now, this does seem to have gone against the Missouri Compromise. However, strictly, strictly speaking, the Missouri Compromise related only to lands that were part of the original Louisiana Purchase. And so that since both New Mexico and Utah are west of the Continental Divide, they were not part of the original Purchase, and so, strictly speaking, were not subject to the Missouri Compromise. With the addition of the western third of the country, extending the United States to the Pacific, the unorganized and Indian lands, which were north of Texas, west of Arkansas, Missouri, Iowa, and Minnesota, and east of the Rocky Mountains, became a problem. While the lands had initially been a buffer with Spanish lands, they were now a barrier between the eastern and western parts of the country. Thousands of immigrants began to cross this section on their way west. And there was clearly an economic and political need for a transcontinental railroad to connect the coast. This meant that in this region, there was a need for a military presence for protection, a form, former, formal excuse me, government structure for laws and new settlements to help secure the region for development. This in turn meant that this large unorganized region had to be politically organized. Between 1844 and 1854, there were eight proposals for the creation of a new territory spanning this unorganized region, usually following the Platte River and called either the Platte or the Nebraska Territory. The name Nebraska was taken from the Oto name for the Platte River. One example was a bill introduced by Congressman Richardson in 1853 to create this oddly shaped Nebraska Territory as shown on this 1853 Colton map. 
all the attempts to create a territory here failed because this territory would be north of the 3630 line and so would be end up being broken into free states and southerners in Congress didn't want to allow that to happen. Finally, a compromise was arrived at with the Stephen Douglas Kansas Nebraska Act of 1854. By this act, most of the Great Plains were divided into two territories. Kansas running essentially west of the state of Missouri to the Rockies and Nebraska consisting of all the lands to the north of Kansas. Note that this means that the Indian territory had been shrunk down to a very small area south of Kansas, which is essentially today's Oklahoma. The creation of these two new territories was accepted in the south because the new ter territories were brought in under the provision of popular sovereignty used previously for Utah and New Mexico, allowing for the possibility of them becoming slave states. Now, this was the point of having two territories rather than just one. For the Southerners thought that Kansas, being directly west of the slave state Missouri, would opt to be a slave state as well. Now, unlike the earlier use of popular sovereignty, this was in direct conflict with the Missouri Compromise, for these new territories were part of the original Louisiana Purchase. This inflamed the passions of abolitionists, leading to the formation of the Republican Party, as well to the conflict in bloody Kansas in 1855 and 56. Ultimately, this was one of the primary causes of the outbreak of the Civil War six years later. So if we look at the United States just before the start of the Civil War, besides the first tier of states and territories along the Mississippi River, the American West consisted of two states, California and Texas, a small Indian territory, and six very large territories. Because of increased immigration to the West and the immigrants' desire for local control, there was a strong push for breaking up these large territories into smaller units. For instance, the New York Times reported on January 11th, 1859, that there were six applications for new territories pending before Congress. However, creation of new territories was blocked by the slavery issue because of the debate over whether they would be free or slave. With secession, however, the dynamic totally changed. When the Southern congressmen from the seceding states left Congress in early 1861, all of a sudden, the now heavily Northern and anti-slavery legislature could create new territories as they desired. Within the first three months of 1861, three new territories were created. One of these was created in the upper Midwest. Earlier, we, had, we saw how the Iowa Territory was created in the northern part of the Louisiana Territory in 1838. In 1846, in 1846 the southern part of this was created as established as the state of Iowa. Then in 1849, the northern part of the old territory was created as the Minnesota Territory. About a decade later, in 1858, the eastern part of Minnesota Territory became a state and the rest was left as an unorganized territory called Dakota. Finally, in 1861, with the Southerners leaving Congress, uh, the newly enabled Congress made Dakota an official territory, but significantly expanded so as to include all what had been the Nebraska Territory north of the 43rd parallel. Much of this had been Siouxland, which was ceded to the United States in 1858. The other two territories created in early 1861 were located in the Southwest. In 1859, the Comstock Lode was discovered in Western Utah, leading to a silver rush to the area. Most of this new population in the area was from California or the East, and they were generally opposed to the Mormons who controlled the Utah government. So they wanted to create a new territory out of Western Utah. Now this was viewed very favorably by Congress, which was anti-Mormon and also wanted to have closer control of the mineral resources there. Thus, the territory of Nevada was created in March, 1861. Similar reasons led to the creation of the Colorado Territory earlier that year. The impetus for this new territory came from the Pikes Peak Gold Rush. In 1858, gold was discovered where Denver is located today. And in 1858 to 59, thousands of people looking to get rich settled along the Front Range in what was then the western part of Kansas Territory. 
These settlers fed, felt distant from the Kansas territorial government in the far eastern part of the territory. You can see what a big gap there is there. And they wanted more local government. Now, at the same time, those in eastern Kansas were afraid the booming population in the Front Range might begin to outvote them. So they were actually in favor of a new territory in the West as well. As a result, in 1859, a bill was introduced to Congress to organize the territory of Kelowna along the Front Range out of basically the western parts of Nebraska and Kansas. Kelowna, though, was never authorized by Congress. Later in 1859, another group petitioned Congress to create a Jefferson territory, essentially in the same areas where Kelowna had been uh, proposed. In this case, a provisional government was established complete with constitution, government, and legislature. This government operated for about two years, but again, this territory was never authorized. Now, these territories were not authorized by Congress, most because the Southerners did not want a new free territory to be created. However, once the Southerners left Congress by seceding, Colorado was created almost immediately on February 28, 1861. This resulted from the desire of the now Northern dominated Congress to have a free territory, one where they would have closer control of the mineral wealth, and also to keep the Confederacy out of this region. Colorado was created from Western Kansas, Southwestern Nebraska, the Northern part of New Mexico, and a large swath of the Mormons, Utah. The territory was named Colorado instead of Jefferson, which had been the name earlier used, for at that time, Thomas Jefferson was unpopular as being a Southerner. Now, as it happens, there was one other possible new territory under discussion just before the Civil War. The New Mexico Territory had been created to the south of Utah in 1850. In 1854, the Gadsden Purchase added about 30,000 square miles to the original acquisition from Mexico. By the 1850s, the southern part of New Mexico Territory was settled mostly by Southerners and called either Gadsdonia or Arizona. There was considerable dissatisfaction with the political situation in New Mexico among the settlers in the southern region. Most of the earlier inhabitants of New Mexico were Spanish, located in the northern part, and those in the south felt, felt neglected by these people. Also, the northern part of the territory was anti-slavery, while the southern part was settled mostly from those by, from slave states. Thus, there was a movement to establish a new territory of Arizona in the southern part of the New Mexico territory, below the 34th parallel. And this is another map where the map maker thought this was going to happen, and so issued a map showing that even though it didn't happen. Um, in 1856 and 1860, conventions were held in the South to create a territory of Arizona. The 1860 convention actually elected a governor and sent a delegation to Congress. The Northerners in Congress refused to ratify this new territory because it was located below the old Missouri Compromise law line and so would have been slave territory. When the Confederacy was created, the Arizonians voted to secede from the Union and join the Confederacy. Confederate troops from Texas came into the territory in support. And at first they were successful, but at the Battle of Glorieta Pass, the Confederate Army was forced to retreat back into Texas. The renegade Arizona territorial government never again had any real power, but they were represented in the Confederate Congress and troops fought under its flag for the rest of the Civil War. Despite Congress's not wanting to accept the territory, Arizona territory as proposed, it was obvious the New Mexico territory was too big and needed to be divided. Thus, in 1863, Arizona territory was created by the US government with the border running north-south rather than east-west. This precluded the de facto recognition of a Confederate territory and the formation of a new slave state. In any case, after the flurry of the three new territories that were created in 1861, other alterations in the Western borders were made in the 1860s. A number of these it involved the expansion of Nevada at the expense of Utah. And this is, uh, I think, quite an interesting uh, series of changes. Now, Nevada was considerably more popular in Congress than Mormon Utah. In 1862, after gold was discovered in the western part of Utah, the border of Nevada was moved east from the 116th to 115th meridian, taking the land and its minerals away from Utah and giving them to Nevada. 
The map on the right was printed just a year after the one on the left, using the same lithographic stone as the earlier one, but with the borders being redrawn by hand. Note that the new border between Nevada and Utah now touches the U. You can see it having been moved over there when you compare the two. Now, more gold was discovered shortly thereafter. So in 1864, the border was again moved one degree further east, now to the 114th meridian. So the new mineral lands would also be part of Nevada and not Utah. The congressional bias toward Nevada and against Utah is further evidenced by noting that Nevada achieved statehood in 1864, only three years after it became a territory, whereas Utah, a territory in 1850, did not become a state until 1896. This last map shows that Nevada was the beneficiary of another congressional bias. In 1867, the southern border of Nevada, which had been at the 37th parallel, was moved south to give the state access to the Colorado River. This took land away from Arizona. It is not unlikely that this was partial payback against the southerners in Arizona who had caused problems in 1861. So now let's turn to the northern regions. In 1846, the lands west of the Continental Divide between the 42nd and 49th parallels were created as the Oregon Territory. Then in 1854, Washington Territory was created from the northern half of what had been the Oregon Territory. Then by the late 1850s, the western part of the reduced Oregon, Oregon Territory had received sufficient population the statehood was applied for, and in 1859, the western half of the Oregon Territory was granted statehood, with the eastern part of its territory being added back to Washington Territory, creating this interesting L, inverted L shape. Shortly thereafter, there were a series of discoveries of gold in eastern Washington, which created pressures to create a new territory for similar reasons for those we saw in relation to Nevada and Colorado. The miners wanted local control, and those in Western uh, Washington were worried about political power being taken away by these new settlements. Thus, in 1863, the Idaho Territory was created by breaking off the Eastern part of Washington Territory. This map came out just afterwards with changes made to the borders and coloring, but the text not updated nearly as well. If you know, Washington, the name Washington was sloppily changed. It's both on one line and on two lines. And note also how the name of the Dakota Territory, which wasn't where it's shown on here, still appears. And the Idaho name appears very small text. Now, the creation of um, Dakota also included the eastern, uh, the western part of the new, uh, of the old Nebraska, Dakota and Nebraska, excuse me. So that it included both the eastern part of what had been Washington Territory and the western part of Dakota and Nebraska. This created a very large unwieldy Idaho Territory, which really for practical purposes had to be broken up into smaller units. The desire to break up this large territory was further prodded by new gold discoveries in 1862 on the eastern side of the rugged Bitterroot Mountains. Like in the previous cases, these miners wanted their own territory, feeling especially cut off from, by the Bitterroot Mountains from the Idaho government to the west. Thus, in 1864, the northeastern part of what had been the Idaho Territory was broken off to create the Montana Territory. Now, it is interesting to look at where the border between Montana and Idaho was, was drawn. The original border in the area between the Washington Territory and the Dakota Territory from about 1861 was along the Continental Divide. And this, of course, came from the original Louisiana Purchase. However, the 1864 border between Idaho Territory and Montana followed the Bitterroot Range to the west. Now, popular legend says that a drunken survey team followed the wrong mountain range. But the real reason the border was shifted west was because of the lobbying of, a, of the miners of Montana and one Sidney Egerton. Egerton was a friend of Abraham Lincoln who had been sent to keep out to keep an eye on things in the newly created Idaho Territory. He did not think he was treated well by the governor and got peeved. So he took the side of the Montana miners and urged Lincoln to have the land between the two mountain ranges placed in the new territory. 
when Montana was created, the southeastern part of the previous large Idaho territory was given back to Dakota, creating this unusual and unwieldy butterfly shape for the Dakota Territory. Now, the very large and awkward shape of Dakota uh, made it inevitable that this lower left section would be broken off into a new territory. And indeed it was in 1868 as the Wyoming Territory, created mostly from the southwestern part of Dakota. But it also included what part that had been part of the uh, easternmost part of Idaho Territory and visiting the Mormons again, the corner, the northeastern corner of Utah. Congress never hesitating to take land away from the Mormons. By 1870, a map of the continental United States shows us a country that had its borders very close to the current ones. All the border changes in the country have been done except for two. The first being to the Dakota Territory. Once Wyoming was created, the Dakota Territory shrunk back to a rectangular shape running between Canada and Nebraska. In 1889, the Dakota Territory was split into two states, North and South Dakota. Now it's interesting that the specific order in which they were created in which the bills were signed is not known as that was kept secret, so neither could claim precedence over the other. The other change in 1870 was the final death throes, uh, after 1870, was the final death throes of the Indian Territory. In 1834, Indian country originally consisted of all the lands in the northwestern part of the unorganized territory that had been part of the Missouri Territory. With the 1854 Act, Kansas Nebraska Act, the Indian Territory was reduced to an area south of Kansas, a small area. Now the Indian Territory at this time was divided into sections for the different tribes. In 1866, some of the land in the Indian Territory was ceded back to the United States government in part because of Indian support for the Confederacy. This was called unassigned territory or Oklahoma and was located mostly in the Western part of what had been the Indian Territory. Beginning in 1879, there was considerable agitation by Anglo-Americans to be able to settle this area, but the government resisted. However, a decade later in 1889, this area was finally opened up to Anglo-American settlement with the quote run of 1889 where over 50,000 people surged into these unassigned lands the first day in order to grab land claims. Finally, in 1890, these lands were created as the Oklahoma Territory out of the Western part of the Indian Territory. This left the last remnant of the Indian Territory consisting only of the Eastern part of the previous territorial lands. The small area was all that was left of what had been a vast Indian Territory. It had been so extensive in 1834, and now it's just a small area. Reading the writing on the wall, in 1905, the citizens of the Indian Territory tried to gain a mission as a state of Sequoia. This was rejected by Congress, which didn't want two smaller states, Oklahoma and, and Sequoia, and also was reluctant to create what would be essentially just an Indian state. Finally, in 1907, the two territories were joined together and admitted as the state of Oklahoma. This was the final change to the political border transformation of the American West, leaving the internal borders of the continental United States basically the same as they are today. Over the course of the 19th century, there were vast changes in the American West. In 1800, it had consisted essentially of three political entities under the sovereignty of France, Spain, Spain, and Britain. In 1900, the American West had 23 political entities with 19 states and four territories. In 1907, with the creation of the state of Oklahoma, the borders in the West were the same as today, with 20 states, two territories, New Mexico and Arizona. These last two territories did become states finally in 1912. I believe it is important to understand the changes we have looked at in this lecture. One cannot understand the history of our country without understanding the history of the political changes of the American West. It is not necessary to understand each and every modification to borders, nor specifically why they were made, but it is important to understand the transformations and the forces that shaped them. We've seen that economic and political factors played an important role throughout from the drive to gain an outlet to the Pacific coast to the desire to keep close control of mineral discoveries. But especially relevant today, we have seen that one of the consistent and powerful forces driving these changes was prejudice. 
prejudice against Indians, prejudice against Mormons, and as manifested in the fight to maintain and spread slavery. By understanding how pervasive prejudice has been in our past, we can be better prepared to diminish its presence in the present. Okay, thank you, Chris. Is it? <laughs> thank know. you, Chris. I think that was a really interesting uh, sweep through the 19th century and giving us an overview of how the, the uh, political landscape has changed. And I must say, I'm glad you brought in the whole element of prejudice because I think that is a topic that is becoming of much more interest uh, as we study the history of this particular country. Now, um, just in terms of questions, Chris, do you want me to try to read the questions or do you That's want That's probably to? the best, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, there was an early question about whether this was being, this uh, presentation was being recorded. Yes, it is. And it is available uh, to members of the Washington Map Society on the, um, Washington uh, Map Society website. Uh, so uh, that is one avenue if you want to uh, look at it further. I think it'll also be on the Rocky Mountain Map Society website. Okay. Um, another question, let's see, it was from um, Ron Gibbs, something about, okay, where did the... Uh, With their much smaller population, why did the Southern, Southerners hold so much political power prior to the Civil War? Well, they, it was, you know, I mean, it, it's um, because of the Senate. Uh, they had, uh, they kept the balance uh, right up until 1850, where they had uh, the same number of slave states uh, as there were uh, free states up till California was admitted. And uh, that gave them equal vote in the Senate. Uh, in terms of population, I mean, obviously they had less power in the House of Representatives. There also were Southern presidents, which uh, had some of the fact as well. Okay, one comment here. You found the perfect map still illustrate this sweeping and detailed talk. I would agree. <laughs> you found a lot of maps that I think we don't normally uh, uh, think about. A question from Jim Wilson. Would you comment on the border squabbles between the San Juan Islands and the Pig War of 1859? Unfortunately, I don't know anything about that. I mean, I, I know that it, it has to do with, you know, the old, I mean, there are a lot of more specific, smaller border, uh, border wars or quote wars. I mean, there was the, uh, the Toledo War between Michigan and, and uh, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan and Ohio, and there are many others. And unfortunately, I just don't know that much about this one. Okay. Richard uh, Vondrak asks, says, John Wesley Powell wanted state boundaries to follow watersheds. Why did that great idea fail? Um, it was generally, they tried to make them uh, uh, rectangular. It was just really easier. Uh, I mean, there were there some of the rivers, you know, were involved, but those are really more the older ones. As Congress was creating these, uh, breaking up the states, they generally tried to keep them rectangular and make them pretty much the same size. I mean, there was a drive, uh, and I'm not sure exactly why, just probably for convenience as much as anything. Okay, Gordon Means, great talk. Does economics drive prejudice or other way around or both? <laughs> um, I think both. Uh, I mean, uh, there's no question. I, I, I emphasize prejudice simply because that's not often talked about and it's also uh, particularly relevant today. Uh, but obviously economic considerations were very important and a lot of the economic considerations, especially in the South had to do with their economics, their dependence on slavery. Okay, J.C. McElveen asks, uh, again, he says, great talk. Could you comment on why there was so much trouble establishing the Southwest boundary of the Louisiana Purchase after 1803? Um, yeah, the, the, cause the, the, the Louisiana Purchase was described as basically the lands drained by the Mississippi up to the crest of the, of the Continental Divide. 
Well, when you get to the south, there is no, the Rockies don't really affect it. And, and there are a lot of rivers that aren't going into the Mississippi. And so there was a lot of debate about that. And the Adams Onus Treaty uh, sort of was what established the borders. And then the question was, how do you read it? Uh, and there are a lot of small, there was, there was actually debates between the states as well, not just between Mexico and the United States. There were actually debates between the states because for instance, Texas came in as part of, uh, as a Mexican territory. Uh, and it was really a question of how you read it and you know what the headwaters were. I mean, there, I don't know all the, in the, I've read a number of them, but I don't know all the things, but it was basically, it just wasn't clear. Okay, Bill Reeser. Uh, what was the benefit to the national government of splitting off new mining areas into new states? Um, well, the, I mean, the locals were very concerned with it, uh, but it was also much easier as a government. I mean, you saw that map of the Kansas territory when it was first created uh, with the Pikes Peak Gold Rush, and there was the eastern provinces, basically the vast plains with nothing on it, and then you had the Pikes Peak settlements. Uh, it was a long way from there. It was very hard to administer. I mean, if you were governor, how were you going to, uh, you know, get your your uh, information out there? The people in the in the Denver area, for instance, you know, if you wanted to buy new land or you wanted to petition the government, you had to go all the way across. So it was easier both for the government and for the people to do it. And also, I think one of the things was that the uh, federal government felt that if they had a local uh, uh, government, they would have a little more control over the mineral resources. And a lot of the, a lot of the, as you saw, a lot of the drive for the smaller territories was because of these mining areas. Hey, Michael Bueller asks, can you comment on how well the commercial map makers, such as Mitchell, Johnson, et cetera, did at tracking and representing the changing state territorial borders in the West? And what's your sense about how they got their information? Um, well, the latter part of that question is interesting. And I assume they had uh, people in Congress or in Washington, lobbyists or whatever, who were um, you know, listening to the latest gossip. I mean, you do see these with these maps where they had uh, non-existent places. I mean, Arizona in, in the Southern part, which never existed, uh, Cologne and things like that. They would hear and they would take a reading from Congress that you know, this was going to pass and they were in the middle of making these maps and it took a while to make these maps. So you couldn't just wait till last moment and get it out in time. So they would draw it in and oops, that was a mistake and they would get rid of it and it would disappear. Now, how they did these, these publishers, they were issuing a number of different kinds of maps. They were issuing wall maps and, and folding maps, which are really very current maps. They were maps that were used by people at the time and they really wanted absolutely current information. Uh, and that was a real struggle for them to get them out. They also issued Atlas maps. So sometimes they would take a more laissez-faire approach to Atlas maps, but if they were in the middle of making a map, for instance, the map that showed, uh, and there are quite a number of maps that show the Arizona territory in, in the Southern part of, of uh, New Mexico. Uh, if it was happening when they were creating that map, they would put it in. Everybody thought it was going to happen, and of course it didn't happen. Um, so, but they, I mean, they did an amazing job. You, the, the ones that are wrong, they often would swap out as soon as they heard that. So they are actually much rarer. It wasn't generally they would leave it in for a whole year of publishing this atlas. They say, whoops, we made a mistake, they get it out. So a lot of those maps, for instance, that wall map that showed Kelowna is a very rare example of that map. There are lots of maps from 1861, but very few that show Kelowna. Anne Boyd asks, what drove the, set, uh, drove the setting of the line between slave and free states at that particular latitude? Um, well, that's, I mean, I, I think it's simply because it was a straight line. So, I mean, if you were going to pick a line, and obviously they had to, if they were going to pass a law, you know, saying that you couldn't have slavery above a certain line, they had to pick a line. And it was a line where, yes, um, Kentucky and Virginia were slave states, and they were north of that line, but they were already in as slave states. And I think it was just, it's, if you look at uh, uh, the, the, you know, the, the map of the United States, it's the straightest, longest line, you know, in, in the eastern United States. So, and then everything below that was basically a slave state, uh, and most of the states north of that. So I think it was just, it, it, it kind of worked. 
Okay, Tom Sander uh, asks, map, most of your maps appear to be AJ Johnson and Colton. Was there a competition between these firms in mapping the, of the American West? Well, all the publishers were competing. Um, Johnson actually kind of followed on from Colton. Uh, and I don't know, I don't think they overlapped, but uh, certainly Mitchell and Johnson were competing and they were trying to get out the latest and greatest maps. Uh, and that also might have been one of the reasons they would make some of these mistakes, trying to be, you know, cutting edge and show up before the, their competitor. Okay, um, Carrie Gordon has a comment. Much of the story of how the West was divided up resonates with political issues facing, okay, facing the nation today. Uh, I guess we realize that. Um, just a second, oops. Can you comment on Colorado and Oregon's attempts to ban African Americans from their territories after the Civil War? That was from David Keller. Um, well, I, the debates that, that I talked about were um, debates for government allowing slavery or not. Uh, it did not, of course, change the minds of the people in those territories. I mean, they might be a free state, uh, I mean, Kansas, bloody Kansas, you had, uh, you know, as, as I said, the reason they created the two territories was because Kansas was just west of Missouri. So the southerners thought, okay, that's a, a smaller area. It's an area, uh, slavery tended to follow the economics to being able to have the kind of uh, economy they wanted. They thought, well, Kansas would be a natural. So the southerners kind of flooded in there, but also the abolitionists, there were all these advertisements for maps of Kansas and to move to Kansas up in New England, getting abolitionists to move there. So there it was a case where they actually, the people who believe certain things moved in. The other territories, it was just the people who were there. And there was a lot of prejudice. Uh, there is still a lot of prejudice. Uh, it, there was more overt prejudice at that time. And I would say a, a larger percentage of the populations in all of these territories, uh, you know, except if they had a very strong abolitionist base, uh, was probably against the blacks. And I think that was just an internal thing where the people in Colorado and the people in Cor Oregon saw the blacks as a, a uh, threat to their economy and wanted to get rid of them. Okay, Andrew Wapple, uh, thank you for your presentation. Were there any well-known examples of when a border was defined in words but when it came to delineating it on the actual map, they found it was not quite as doable as originally anticipated. Uh, there actually, um, the, I mean, yes, there, there is. There was a, a wonderful example uh, up when they created um, Montana, uh, you know, which was taken away from the Idaho Territory. And there was actually the way that Idaho had been defined and the way that Montana was defined, there was a little triangle of land uh, that actually remained as part of the Dakota Territory. Now it was totally separated because the Dakota Territory at that stage was moved back to the east to, you know, basically it had its western borders where north and south do now. But there was a little bit of Dakota between Idaho and Montana uh, up near the Bitterroot Mountains uh, because the de definition of the various borders didn't match out. Now, eventually that became part of Montana, but you can find maps with that little Dakota thumb in there uh, for a very short period of time. There were also, and one of the interesting things that I've learned recently is that the borders of a state are determined by the surveys that were made, not by the description. Uh, for instance, the western border of Colorado has a, a written description. And when the, the guy who made the official survey started up, he actually got offline a little bit and he, he went a little too far west. And when he discovered that, he didn't go all the way back and relay it. He started from where he was, which is to the west of the described line, and went back up to the north. So Colorado today has a little sort of bump in the western border. Uh, which not according to the definition of the state borders, but actually how it was surveyed. A uh, comment from Bill Woodridge, uh, wonderful. And it is the maps which make it a great and comprehensive 
comprehensible story instead of a dry and difficult recitation. I would echo that. Um, apparently, I missed a question from David Keller about the significance of abolition of slavery in Mexico in 1821. Um, well, obviously, there's a great significance to Mexico. I'm not sure that really uh, had a lot to do with uh, the border changes in the United States. I mean, the, the Texans uh, were definitely Southerners when they moved in, and, and I'm sure the anti-slavery of the Mexican government was not something they liked, but they they didn't want to be part of the Mexico anyway. They wanted to become part of the United States, but there may have been some of the influence of that uh, because of the uh, anti-slavery in Mexico. Uh, Michael Bueller would like to know what is the large wall map hanging behind you? <laughs> Why did you choose to hang it there? Uh, because it fit. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, uh, I love wall maps. Uh, it's a Colton, 1854. It actually is a good example of, I mean, it, one of the great things you, is the wall maps, because the wall maps, unlike a lot of the, the, the um, uh, the maps in the atlases, the wall maps changed all the time because they were, again, these were used, so they were keeping them absolutely up to date. So whenever you get a, a, a wall map in the period, you know, 1850s to 1860s, there are always changes in the borders and new information, and they're absolutely fascinating. So I wanted to hang a wall map, but this one because it fit. <laughs> okay. Okay, one last question from Kay Hen. Uh, very interesting and enjoyable. Did you find borders, maps, um, uh, that reflected the, um, I'm sorry, they moved, moved on. Oh, did you find borders maps impacted by Welsh miners moving following gold? Um, I didn't find anything particular about Welsh miners. I mean, certainly the miners were big drivers of the creation of these territories. Uh, and as I said, one of the things that I thought was interesting, it wasn't just them who wanted local control. It was also the territorial governors in the distant territorial place because you had all this population moving into the mining area and they were afraid they'd be outvoted and they might shift the capital. For instance, those in Kansas were happy to get rid of Colorado because they figured you know, they'd be outvoted and the capital of Kansas would be moved out to Denver. But I didn't find anything particularly about Welsh miners. Okay, two more questions have come up. Let's, we'll end the questions after these two. Uh, uh, the evolving of the US state boundaries was not a peaceful creation. Can you elaborate on more conflicts in parens, Indians, blacks, et cetera, that drove the boundaries? Uh, it was definitely not uh, friendly. Uh, the biggest uh, conflict was the it was Kansas, uh, the bloody Kansas, 1856, uh, 55, 56, um, when that was, the borders were established, but that was over whether, because of popular sovereignty, whether it would be free or slave. I don't think, uh, well, you had actually, I mean, uh, my favorite example is the Toledo War, where uh, Michigan sent uh, troops into uh, Toledo, but uh, they never fired anything. I don't think within the United States, um, I can think of any border uh, wars or wars that actually occurred. I mean, you would have border wars obviously between different states if they disagreed with things in accordance with Mexico, but I don't think any of the political decisions on where the borders went uh, led to fighting. Okay, last question. Small bits of Illinois lie west of the Mississippi River because of the river shifting. Was that a big argument? Um, I don't know about that in particular, but I do know that the riparian borders are always a problem. Um, uh, Angel uh, gave a great lecture on the border between New Mexico and the United States, where the Rio Grande shifted and you have the, the border conflict there. Uh, there was a disagreement between, I think it was um, Georgia and South Carolina about their border because rivers do change and it depends on you know how you read the, where the border was. That is something that there's a lot of law uh, that still goes down and they actually use old maps sometimes to determine what was intended. It's really kind of an interesting area. So Chris, thanks for uh, I think a very enlightening talk and I think
as everybody has sort of indicated, it was great. It was comprehensive and you've come up with quite a few uh, maps that we probably weren't aware of some of the things they show. And as a thank you, uh, the Washington Map Society would like to present you with two small gifts. Uh, usually I try to pick something related to the city where you live. Well, I've decided to uh, represent the city from where you came. So here is initially a cut lines map, metal map of Philadelphia. Oh, cool. And then by a, and then a local Washington DC card maker called Cherry Blossom Creative. Uh, we have a map of Philadelphia. So there's a set of note cards. Great, thank you very much. And thank you everybody for coming. I, I hope it was interesting. Thank you. And I, I think we can stay on for about 10 or 15 minutes if people want to talk with each other or I guess ask any further questions. <laughs>